Hmm. And the uh, uh, first thing I'm going to say is, let's see, I'm checking who's here. Okay, so for a person who's not here, uh, anything submitted on P1 after this moment is invalid. So uh, this was the last instant that a, an individual could have uh, taken advantage of my good nature. Okay, and they're not here. All right. Okay, so um, let's take a look at uh, what we uh, usually do in our agenda. And it begins with review. What questions do you have? Uh, these questions are in relation to project one or project two. Uh, questions for now are relating to anything other than project two, because we're going to talk about project two in a little bit. Um, this might relate to project two. Um, mm -hmm. Could you kind of go over um, storing stuff on the stack, like accessing the, the value, values that you store? It's, it happens to be related to project two, I suppose, but. Okay. Can I uh, expand that? Uh, sure. to consider uh, accessing anything in actual RAM? Go for it. Just, okay. Although um, I would second his stack requirements specifically. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, well, why don't we begin with memory anywhere? Okay, so all variables in a higher level language. Um, I'm just gonna go off camera for a minute. Yeah, it's okay. Oh, thank you. I'm not wearing anything I can't get. All right, then. Okay, so somebody's mic is open and uh, uh, giving us a uh, impression of what's going on in their house. Okay, <clears throat> so when you're using a higher level language, uh, you think all of your local variables uh, are in memory. And that's sometimes true, but the compiler uh, goes through an optimization step where it will try to find oper uh, opportunities to keep variables, which otherwise would have been in RAM, in registers. Now, as a human coder, you can do that really, really well. In fact, so far, except for a format string, everything that you've done has been in, uh, in a register. And certainly that's the ideal case because registers are blindingly fast and memory is glacially slow. Okay. So, but sometimes we do have to get things into and out of uh, memory. And uh, so any a variable of any type uh, is nothing more than a name, which we'll call a, a label. Is that how you spell? No. Lably? No. I, I can never yeah. write. Yeah, EL. Yep, I can never write label. So any variable is nothing more than a name and a place or address and a size. So all variables, all they are is a name associated with an address and a size. Then of course there's some contents, right? But that's understood. So let's take a look at what you had for uh, in the dot data, and then you had a FMT colon, and then you had dot ASCII Z for uh, making it null terminated, and then you had some text. 
Okay. So where is the name here? Well, the name and the label, that's uh, format. Uh, and that name and label also specifies the address. Now, the way that uh, an ARM system uh, spec, go ahead. The professor, you cut out for a moment. Am I still cut out? Yes, you cut out. Am I cut out now? No, you're good no. now. Okay, good. All right. Also, uh, when we watch videos, it does also include times where you cut out. Okay, well, you let me know when that happens. <clears throat> okay, so well, in then. this case, the label and the address, uh, the label is what you refer to, but the assembler will compute an address associated with that label. So the name of something is uh, a, a convenience for the human being and a compiler or assembler will calculate a translation from that name to a location, to an address. Okay, so the way that you got access to this is, um, uh, in, uh, actually, I showed you how to do it this way. There are different ways of doing it. So an ADR instruction and where to put the address, and then you gave it the label. So this is the instruction that the assembler interpreted as your command to figure out the address that the first information associated with that label is to be found. So uh, X0 at this point has a pointer to uh, the letter T. Okay. So, and then you might have called something like puts and puts has the instructions to read bytes out of memory. So all I've shown you so far is how we calculated the address of the word text. But you've also had code in particular in MySTRLEN, which will read one character at uh, a time. Professor, Let's you take uh, an example. You that fax be, machined. Yeah. You, you fax machined, Professor. All right. Am I back now? TikTok, yes. You are. TikTok. Okay. So LDR B for byte. And if it's a byte, it has to go into a register and some number, register N, uh, word, W register N. And uh, well, see, X0 already has um, a uh, pointer to a string in it. So I'll just dereference X0. And that dereferenced byte will go into WN. So this is the basic way, this demonstrates how data is read from memory. So if I wanted to store to memory, it would be, uh, let's say I wanna uh, store a single byte. So um, at this position. So instead of the letter T, let's say I wanted it to be a different letter. Then I could say store byte from some register into X zero, the into, sorry, into the location in memory pointed to by X zero. So this is from location pointed to by X zero, read a byte. 
into Wn, and this is to the location pointed to by x0 store a byte. Okay, so you've only got the two instructions, LDRs and SDRs. Now, it turns out that once we start talking about vector instructions, there are some other. Uh, one that uh, you might want to uh, look up uh, that you might want to use in a future project is an instruction called LD1, which, as I've hinted, has to do with vectorization. And I'll, I'll spend only uh, less than a minute on vectorization. That's an example of SIMD or single instruction, multiple data. And uh, you can just imagine that how often you have, let's say, a loop where um, you multiply uh, you, you multiply a, all the members of, a, of an array by two. Well, if that's what you're doing, why not do four of them at a time? Why not do eight of them at a time with a single instruction? So that's what it means to be single instruction, multiple data or vectorization. So uh, a single instruction can operate on multiple registers at the same time. Maybe ST1. OK. Now, let's cover what it means to have a local variable stored in memory. What makes it a local variable is that its, its address is relative to the current stack position. That's it. That's what makes it a local variable. Local variables are on the stack. And that's it. So instead of x0, as, I, as you see here, if it were a local variable, it would be, let's say I wanted to load an int. So that would be an LDR into some re W register because it's an int. And it would be at some dereferencing of the stack pointer, probably with an offset. Okay. Now this syntax neither uh, professor. three increments or giga or what. I was going to say, what about the exclamation point? But you probably just answered that. Yes, I just did. Thank you. Right. So this instruction has neither pre or post incrementing of anything. So if offset were uh, 100, then uh, wherever the stack pointer is pointing, add 100 to it. And then from that location, read an integer into a register. Okay, so the only difference between accessing a heap or a global is what register you're using to calculate the address. If it's the stack, it's a local variable. Okay. So I think I realized what more my question was. Um, it was, so let's say, Obviously, we have to track where the stack pointer is for like x30 and stuff. But like, what about like when you have different like multiple uh, variables, like trying to access and do stuff with the stack? How do you how do you manage that? Okay, so the the different variables are uh, accessed, read or written by. Uh, 
choice of offset. Uh, Professor, with could you could you repeat what data. you said? You went you yeah. went staticky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So which data you want to read or write in memory is controlled by the address of that data. Right? And also the width. What do we need to know about data? We need to know its address and its size. That's the important things you must know in order to use memory. So if it's a local variable, the instruction, the combination of instruction and what kind of register determines the width. So for example, an LDRB and a W register, that's a byte. Okay, an LDR with a W register, that's an int. An LDR with an X register, that's a long. Comma, comma, comma. And then the stack pointer with an offset. So think of your stack. Your return address, that's the value that will go back into X30. And then let's say uh, here's, uh, here's a long, let's say uh, here's an int. Now your stack pointer is pointing perhaps here. That means its offsets are all positive because the positive or increasing addresses are this way. So at zero units, zero bytes away from the stack pointer, you'll find an int. Four bytes away from the stack pointer, you'll find a long. So once again, I'll repeat. To use memory, you have to know a width and a location address. So the width is determined by the instruction, the combination of the instruction and the register. And the address can be taken from a register optionally plus an offset. And there's even a way of bit shifting the offset so that you can multiply it by two, four, eight, 16, a million, uh, whatever the power of two is, around a million, okay? Now, the reason that you've got that capability is because this offset is gonna be stored in the instruction and we know that instructions have a fixed width. So this might be uh, a side side question now, but how do you do dynamic memory then in um, assembly where the, you're not really sure how how much space you need to set aside? Well, dynamic memory, uh, you always know how much you're going to set aside in order to do a dynamic memory allocation because you have to do dynamic memory allocation in fixed sized units, some sized unit, right? But if your higher level goal is to store a variable amount, then you need some type of data structure. Oh, I don't know, like a linked list, which is what project two is. And it would become multiple dynamic memory allocations. Okay. Okay, good. All right, so uh, does that uh, finish our review? Okay, it sounds like it does. So uh, I am now showing, there it is finally, I'm now showing the second project. 
And you have to uh, do exactly what I say. Uh, and it is to create a linked list that is sorted with both insertion, inserting in the sorted way, and deletion. So the goal of this project, the reason why it's a thing, is to have you practice dealing with structs as well as dynamic memory allocation. So let me demonstrate for you a, an execution of this program. Okay, so here's my program. And there's nothing uh, on the, the linked list because I've given it no input. Now, how do you specify additions, you uh, insertions? You do it right on the command line. So here's the value 10. Okay, so it says the head points to this address. And notice there's only one node in the linked list. And guess what? It's found at that address. So it's the head. And it contains a payload of 10. And that is this 10. Now, being a linked list, and this being not only the head, but the tail, the next points to null. That's how you know it is a, the last node in the linked list. Now, you notice that you got your input from the command line. That's why project one uh, included getting your data from the command line. So now you know how to do that. All right, let's take a look at a more complicated example. Uh, how about uh, 20 and zero? So notice the payloads come out in sorted order. It is a sorted linked list. But look at the addresses. So the head is at A1 to A0. The next is at 1260. And the next after that is at 1280, et cetera, et cetera. So read this like this. The head should be the first line printed. So 12A0. Here's a node at 12A0. It has a next of 1260. Guess what? Here's a node at 1260. Here's a next at 1280. And here is, guess what? A node at 1280. Its next is zero. Uh, professor? Guess what? It's last. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, you uh, froze for a moment. All right. Now, if I freeze for a, a split second, don't say anything. That's. Nah, it was like you froze. For a few seconds while you're trying to explain something, I think, but all right. All right. Did the did the video freeze or the audio as well? Believe both. On my all end, right. neither froze. Hmm. Yeah, you were could just into. Could yeah. just be okay. could just be college right. internet then. Let's move on. Okay. So these are additions, but there's also deletion. So uh, yeah, and don't use zero because then it's like negative zero. So I apologize, don't do zero. Let's use five there, okay? So still it's sorted, but suppose I want to remove the 10. So I'll say minus 10. So any negative number is a delete. Okay, so notice the 10 is missing it was removed from the middle. Okay. Uh, well, how about the case of uh, 10, 20, 50, 20, 20, 20, 50. Okay, let's just see, those are only additions. 10, 20, 20, 20, 20, 50, 50. Okay. Now, if you get uh, a negative and you want to remove one of the 20s, which one does it remove? 
the first one, the first one it finds. Okay. By the way, has anybody noticed that these values are different every time? Yep. And okay. Professor, when when the program finishes, do you want it to run through and deallocate all the things that are unused? Yes. Thank you for that. Let's go back to uh, nothing. No input. And let's add to that a program called Valgrind. Just wait. Okay, so here's the output of the program. And this is the correct result. If you do not see this line, you have a bug. And you will get points off. Thomas, you have a question. Uh, what about the error summary thing? Error summary. So uh, do you want me to explain? Errors... Yeah, what are, you, what are you talking about? All right. Um, in mine, I'm getting a invalid read of size four addresses, blah, blah, blah. However, I do still get all heat blocks were freed. No leaks are possible. Okay. I have errors, but I'm still getting all freed blocks. Okay, well, you got to fix those errors too. So let me, uh, uh, let me change what I said. You have to see this line and you have to see this line. Okay, so that is with nothing. Now let's do this 10, 20, 50, 20, 20, 20, 50, 20, minus 20. How about minus 50, uh, minus 50, minus 20, minus 20. Could you do so like let's minus three as well? All right, let's do that. Minus three, okay. So I've got two minus 50s, so both of the uh, 50s are gone. I removed one of four 20s, and I silently ignored the minus three because it wasn't found in the list at all. Okay. Now let's do the valve grind. Should get this very same output and no errors and no missing memory. So Valgrind, one of the things that Valgrind does is look for memory leaks. Any questions about the project? How do we uh, deallocate memory in, in assembly? Uh, that would be by uh, changing my share. Okay, so allocating memory is done with malloc and freeing memory is done with free. Okay, uh, let me remove the parentheses to that end and this would be the number of bytes. This would be pointer to the first byte previously malloced. Okay, so in assembly language, a malloc might look like this. Uh, a move into which register? X0. X0, why not W0? Uh, because it's uh, going to be memory, right? an address, right? Or the well, free needs an address? Let's try this. Uh, how about we say man malloc? 
Now look at the calling specification, the signature. The first one says it returns a pointer. So absolutely the return value is gonna come into X zero. My question was, where does size go? And does it go, we know it goes into a zero register because it's the first parameter. You had that right. But it wasn't clear, does, is, is it gonna be a W or an X? And that's why I did the, the man. So it says that it's a size T and I know that that is a long. So the number of bytes for to malloc will be X zero. So coming back. So this is gonna be something like X zero. Uh, I don't know, let's call it uh, 32 bytes. And then BL to malloc. And then what's, what is in X zero is one of two values. Null, if the malloc failed, or pointer to the new memory. Okay. Now the free is, uh, I don't know what you wanted to do with that uh, return value, but let's make believe it's gonna go into uh, a, a relatively safe register. So let's say move um, to X19 of X0. So X0 is going to be copied into X19. Now the equivalent free would be move into X0 from X19, BL free. Now the important part here is not where the pointer was finally stored, that could have been stored in memory. That's up to you. In fact, in this program, uh, you will be storing pointers in memory. After all, the struct that you're using is uh, struct uh, A, I don't feel like writing node. So, but let me, I don't wanna confuse you. So I'll write node. And that is a pointer, a node star, next, and then an int, uh, and that's payload. So all of these nodes are going to be in memory, which means you're gonna to have to store values in the memory. Like a shot in Thomas, uh, I'm getting broken up. Assembly. You lagged out, Thomas. Start again. Start again, please. Yeah, I, I noticed. Uh, how would we write something like a struct in uh, assembly? There's there's no writing of a struct in assembly. You're the programmer. You know that based upon the base address of a struct, you know that the members of the struct are at certain offsets and they have certain widths. So there's no syntax like this in assembly language. 
I also have a question. You, you just know. Yeah, what's the next question? Um, so when you were showing, uh, do you mind scrolling up a little bit on the notepad? This far? Um, yes, you were showing an example of the stack pointer and the offset. So if there's no pre or post increment, is the stack Like, is it not save and changes? That Nathan, are you on Wi-Fi? Thomas. Did I break up? I'm Wi-Fi? Yes. Nathan, you're on Wi-Fi? Yes. Don't use Wi-Fi. Yes. Okay, this is this is on you guys. Okay. Um, okay, buy a goddamn cable and stick it in the wall. My only question was when you use just the stack pointer and an offset and there's no pre or post increment, is the stack pointer's address changed and updated after the, the load or no. does it remain the same? No, okay. it stays yeah. the same. Oh, makes sense. Right. Okay. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about the uh, about the project? Uh, I have a question, though you may have already answered it. Mm -hmm. uh, for making something like a public variable, such as, for example, in how we write this in C, we would do a uh, struct node head. Is there something like that in assembly or absolutely not? Uh, so your question is, uh, your question might be, what's the equivalent of a global, right? So in a program like this, you might make your head pointer uh, a global variable. That would be reasonable. So uh, I put a, um, uh, a, a reference document online yesterday, I believe. So let me go find it. Uh, your session was closed. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay, reference material. Mm, apparently I didn't put it here. Let's go to the GitHub. All right. And which one is it? Is it this one? No, 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 I sent it as an email. That's right. Okay, so I sent you a document as an email. Let me stop sharing and I'll go find that document. Uh, hopefully I get a record of the emails that I send to the class. If not, I'm gonna have to ask All right, uh, I have no idea how to find the email from me. Uh, the most recent email you appear to have sent the class in its entirety is the, uh, is the mean grade of the first project. One of the uh, things you put on the GitHub was dated two days ago. Is that the one you're referring to? I'm not sure, is it? Maybe it is. Because that's the only uh, new one. The rest are like 20 mm, days old. No, no, I didn't put it online. I gave you a link. So let me see if I can find it again. Uh, using AS. And here it is. OK, I'm going to email this to you again. Actually, I'm going to put it into the GitHub. So add a link, uh, bear with me a moment. Using a S. And now I will share again. Uh, so here is using a S. Click on that. 
and you get this uh, stupid feature. So click on using AS again. And boy, this is uh, a real document from 1994. Cool. This document's older than you are. Okay, but take a look at where I am. Assembler directives. Now, some of these you'll already know, like ASCII Z. There it is. So let's say you wanted to make a global variable that will uh, store the head pointer. Well, if you come down here, I draw your attention to space, and it is not the final frontier. Okay, so that's how you would allocate space for a global variable. And you can even initialize it, which I would suggest initializing to zero since that's what your head pointer should start out as. Uh, we would put the fill as a zero or size of zero. Oh, I'm guessing it's fill. The fill, the size better be enough to hold a pointer. And you give it a label, like, oh, I don't know, head pointer. Or you don't have to be confined to thinking like you're using a high level language. An alternative to storing it in memory would be to design your program in such a way that it could the head pointer can always live in a register safely. Because going out to memory takes a long time. Okay, so they're all in here. Uh, so, dot, dot align, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So by declaring it, um as a space, like just as its own label and everything before any of the executions happen, that is what makes it a global variable. Exactly. Okay. Right. If you were to look at a disassembly of your uh, executable, and let's say you had a global variable uh, who was a string, let me say it was a C string, and the string was uh, happy, happy, joy, joy. If you were to print the binary of your executable, you will find happy, happy, joy, joy embedded in your executable. So global variables are a little different in that, here comes that picture again of the address space of your program, there is one page of memory that is inaccessible to help you debug. Then there is a section of memory where your code and globals live. If you were to look at how an operating system actually initializes the address space, there's a file, of course, your EC, your executable file, and that is literally copied here. So you can see that global variables are actually part of the executable. So for example, uh, using the assembler directive dot size, that space is, is set aside in the actual executable. So Nathan, I think that answered your question. Okay, we're still looking for questions about the project. Um so we're so we're getting them out of order. Um in the program, are we supposed to um, 
detach the um the like move them around so like zeros in front or whatever the lowest number is and let's say that was like the last thing i put in so that would become the new head like that no, or this is this is a sorted linked list uh which i would imagine you've covered linked lists in data structures yeah. okay yeah so Let's say you had, or, or so I'm gonna do is here's version one, here's version two, here's version three. So, uh, uh, so let's just say zero, one, two. Okay, so to start off with head uh, points to nothing, right? True? Okay. So now let's insert the value 100. So somewhere in memory, you're going to allocate a struct. It's next because it's you discover that it's the first item on the uh, it's the it's the first item on your list. So its head, its next, sorry, is going to be nothing, and your head is going to be, and the payload is 100. So there, we inserted 100. Now let's insert 25. So somewhere in memory, don't know where, but there's going to be a struct dynamically allocated by you it will get the value 25. And by virtue of your fantastic programming skills, you will insert it prior to the next node that is the same or bigger in payload. So that means this pointer will point. Now notice this hasn't moved. It's still in memory somewhere. Its payload is 100. Its pointer for next is still zero. And head is now pointing here. So that's an insertion. It came before, it was inserted before the value in the list, which had a, its own payload greater than or equal to the payload you're trying to insert. So what are your, what are your different uh, conditions? You might be inserting the first node. You might be inserting All right, am I still with you? Uh, sound check. Okay, you might be inserting a new first node. You might be inserting a new last node. Or you might be inserting a new node in the middle. Those are your cases. And I would encourage you to develop the insert just like this. So write the code it, that would do the insertion if the list was empty. Write the code that would uh, find uh, a value uh, in the list to insert before. So that would be the new head. Then in, insert uh, something that is greater than anything in the list, right? So just break it down step by step. Now the same thing is true for deleting. Maybe you're deleting what was the last node and you've got to fix up the node before it. Let's say you're deleting a node in the middle. That means you have to fix up the node before it and, well, you have to fix up the node before it, do a free of the node that you found to delete. Okay, you, you've all done this. I believe uh, everyone in the class with one exception has taken 
uh, data structures. I made a waiver for one person. I have a completely random question, but it's been bugging me for a while. Why does it always say 9.41 a.m. Tuesday, January 9th? What, where? On your iPad. Uh, be said all to me, I never noticed it. <laughs> it said that this entire, it said that always, even in other classes, it's such a weird bug. Yeah, that, that's an interesting one. So you mean well, it's not 9.41 a.m. on January 9th? Yeah. So, it's not. Uh, Don't fix uh, it. It's, you leave it. Maybe it's telling yeah. something. January 9th, 2022 at 9.41 a.m. Yeah, where the heck is the clock anyway? Uh, here, how about that? The clock. Uh, well... Oh, uh, hmm. the clock is correct, isn't it? Like, where the hell is it now? How about world clock? You know, screw it. I don't want to take time out of class for this. All right. So just, just think of it as one of those things. OK, questions about the project. Reminder, you have to interpret negative numbers, the negative being interpreted as a delete, and then you take the absolute value or the, the negation, right? So if it's a minus 10, that means you're supposed to delete a 10. How do we go about like figuring out if it's negative? Would we just read the first bit? Um, as it happens, yes, but that's not how you'll do it. Okay. Uh, you can compare it against zero, right? <laughs> and one of the choices is less than. Press and, that's formatted, it, you know? and that's formatted as CLE? What? Uh, uh, never mind. Uh, I remember... You for printing, you mean? Compare, no, there's a compare... CGE is compare greater than or equal to CL no, would be compare less than. No, no, no. Let's let's go over. There would be uh, to use the compare instruction, you would do compare of two values and then a branch greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to, or equal to zero. There are two additional instructions that would be uh, compare branch if zero, compare branch if not zero. But those are the only two choices in that shorthand, shortcut instruction. Zero or not zero. If you want to do less than, greater than, et cetera, et cetera, you have to do it this way. Okay. All right. Now, in the time we have left, I am now going to write project one with your help. All right, we don't need that anymore. We are going to uh, go here. Okay. Okay, let's do the boilerplate. Uh, so it's, this is the text section. You're gonna align uh, on an even address and you have to have a main that is visible to the linker. So there's main. 
So uh, the first, I want to build this incrementally. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, uh, write a main that knows how to iterate through the argv array. So here's main. I know that I'm calling functions, so I must uh, save x30. Okay. And uh, if I remember right, ultimately I'll want to save two other registers. So uh, STP uh, X19 and X20 into the stack with a pre decrement of 16 bytes. Then STR X30, there's, I have to do that. SP uh, again, 16 bytes. I have a question. Go ahead. In your, in your in the specs that you gave us, you mentioned that we also have to save X29. And I looked that up and it says it's the frame pointer. Is that why you said we had to save it? Yeah, yeah, that's why I said, so I'll do what I said then. Now it turns out that the frame pointer is used by the debugger. So if you're willing to uh, give up on the debugger making use of it, then you can use it. That's a choice you can make. So, but I'll, I'll do it. So, um, all right. And uh, X, uh, whoops. Ah. Apparently, okay. So I'm doing the boilerplate that will go at the end of the program. Notice that the LDP, the Ls are in the reciprocal order, the mirror order of the uh, Ss stores. And uh, now I'll uh, move something into X0 this is the very end of the program. And I'll put uh, the zero in X0 and return. And now I've written enough to test first time. Okay, so GCC and what the hell, I'll use the debugger, it'll enable debugging, the dash G. And uh, what did I call it? P1.S. A dot out, and it works. Uh, I could try this, val, val grind uh, dot slash A dot out, and that should be fine. Should be. Good. OK. Uh, so at this point, I know that I'm interested in X1, because that's where argv is. So I'm going to move. Now I have preserved X1 in X19. And maybe I'll keep some notes. Okay, I'm keeping some notes. All right, now this is gonna be the top of my loop. So I'll put in a temporary label. And I wanna know if what's being pointed at by X19, what's being pointed at by X19 contains a zero. Okay. And I know I want that pointer twice. So I'm going to use X20 holds the pointer to char. 
Okay, so that is the same as star argv. So here I'm going to dereference x19. So ld r and it's a pointer, so it's going to go into x20 from what's at x19. Okay. And compare and branch if zero, and that's X20. So if X20, which is a star char, if that's a zero, I wanna end the program. So that would be branching to a two forward. Here's the two. Okay, damn it. Okay. Easy question. What if you didn't put the F in front of the two? Uh, then it would be the assembler syntax error. These okay. are temporary labels. Yeah. So, because uh, I noticed it in the function uh, folder on GitHub as well. I was just curious. So, so take a look. These are temporary labels. So I could reuse two over and over and over again. So, how do we know? How does the assembler know which one to go to? Well, that's the F. So the F says, go to the symbol two, that's forward from here. Because you, in assembly language, you're doing a constant set of go-tos, a set of branches. So that's why they make it so easy to come up with throwaway labels. Otherwise, believe me, if you didn't have these, you'd be spending half of your day trying to figure out variations of top. Yeah, or bottom. Okay. Uh, actually, I can. Ah, oh, crap. I'm not running. Apparently, I'm not running Vim. I'm running VI. Okay. All right. So now I know that X20 is a valid uh, string. So I want to print it. That's all I want to do here. So I'm going to move uh, to into X0, X20. And I'm going to BL puts. OK, there is, a full, there is a complete program. No, that's not. It's not complete. And that would be an unconditional branch to one backwards. All right, let's try it. Okay, apparently I have a bug. Does anybody know what the bug is? Notice it's printing a dot out over and over and over again. Uh, you're not you're not incrementing forwards one and or therefore you're stuck in an infinite loop. Good, good. And where can I fix that? Uh, you can put it after puts. Mm, I can put it, uh, but that would mean I'd have to add another instruction. Uh, you can add a comma to uh, LDR for the X19. Uh, technically, you don't need a counter. You can just use the addresses. Right, but yeah. I, I'm in fact I'm not going to use I'm not going to use a counter. That's right. So let's see how I would be using the addresses. I might end there. Let's, let's do it. Right. So let's try it again. Whoops, that's the wrong. Okay, now a dot out. Uh, one, uh, two, three. Okay, so I'm developing my program incrementally. I've, I've completed the first one, first part of my first increment. Any questions about the code you see here? Okay, Gabe, what is the purpose of line 12?
Line 12 is to take the RV and put it into one, the RV value. Uh, right. Could you say it again? Because you were almost right. It takes the pointer that it takes the pointer for argv and puts it into register one. Right? No. No. Or is it the value? Okay. So the second argument to main is argv, and that's a char star star. It's an x1. Line 12 preserves x1 up into x19. Oh, the so other you way had, yeah. You had, yeah, you had it the other way around. Gotcha. Okay, uh, Meadow, uh, what is the purpose of line 16? Um, it puts the value of um, x20 into x0. Okay, that's exactly right. That's what it does. But what does it mean? Why is why is it there? Okay, so use the previous two instructions, lines 14 and 15. So X19 is arg is argv. Argv is a char star star. So what goes into X20 is a char star. Notice how the pointer, one of those pointers, it's a pointer to a pointer, has been removed. I followed one of the pointers here. Where it points to is now an X20. So X20 is now a pointer to char. X20 is a char star. X19 is a char star star. Okay. All right. Let's add in a real printf and we'll stub out my strlen. We'll just stub it. Okay. So uh, we go to the uh, data segment, and uh, I want to, a, a printf, and I wanted to uh, do the count, which is percent %d. That's the, where the output of my strlen goes. And then I wanted a string. And because I want it to be pretty, I am surrounding both of those values with brackets. They don't have to be there. Here's a new line. Okay. So now I'm going to stub out my strlen. And all it's going to do, it's a stub, right? So it's just going to move um, into x0. Uh, a recognizable value. I'm picking 17 at random and a return. So right now my str len, I'm building incrementally. So I just stubbed it out, but I want to do a full printf now. So so what needs to go into x0 for the full printout printf? Go ahead, Thomas. Uh, you need to move, you need to set the address for the printf into x0. The address of the format. Good. So ADR, x0, FMT. What goes in x1? Uh, when you want to set uh, the return value for my strum into w something that isn't zero. Mm -hmm. In fact, the way I'm headed right now, I'm bound for tears. So let's You're back going up. You're to that before address. Exactly right because x zero 
when I call BL to my SDR LEN, it's going to blow away X0. So I need to do this first. So um, X20 has the char star. So I need that in X0. So move X0, X20 from X20, and then BL to my, uh, my STR LEN. That returns, in this case, just 17 all the time, but that needs to be an X1. So move, where did it come back? Came back in X0. Uh, why an X and not a W? Because it's an int that's being returned. You are absolutely right. Let me change that. Okay, good. And now finally, the, uh, let's see, I can just delete that line and change this to X2. And instead of uh, puts, it'll be printf. Okay, I've written a little, let me test a little. Okay. Oh, what did I use? The wrong quotes or something? Um... Oh, you forgot to oh. put ASCIZZ. Yep, yep. You're right, I did. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I want my money back. Okay, so there's a, a valid, there's my 17. That was a stubbed out. And there's uh, the output of uh, the dot, dot slash a dot app. Uh, one, two, three, four. Okay, so good, I'm happy. Uh, let me move on to the next step. Anybody have any questions? So now all we have to do is finish my STR LEN. You could write yourself some reminders. X0 comes in with uh, a pointer to a null terminated string. Uh, no functions are being called, so we can relax the backing up and restoring of X30, et cetera. Okay, so I'm gonna write this function one way and then I'll show you a different way of doing it. So uh, we're gonna delete that. We know that we have a value coming in at X0. So why don't we use a counter uh, at W, we have to return W, so let's return a W, well, let's count in Ws. So move to W1, in other words, not X0 uh, of WZR. And here is the top of my loop, LDRB. And I want to, uh, uh, into W2 of what's at X0. If it's the null terminator, Compare branch zero to two forward. Otherwise, add W1, W1, one, and branch to one back. And here's two. Uh, so all we need to do is uh, the counter is in W1. So let's move uh, to W0 from W1 and return. Professor, you forgot something. What did I forget? You forgot to increment LDRB. Oh, son of a gun. I would have had another infinite loop. Okay, and I can fix that by incrementing by one. Yes, I'm going by bytes. Okay, let's try it. Uh, oops, I forgot something. Uh, 
Okay, I was supposed to compare W2. And branch if zero. Yeah, I'll do it this way. Here. Beautiful. Okay. So let's look at the code. Ask me any questions. Okay, now I want to challenge you, and somebody already mentioned it. I want to rewrite my STRLEN in a different way where there's no counter. And then I'll explain why that code will be much faster. Can you think of how to do it? Wouldn't it be something relating to like the addresses? finding the difference between the addresses. Okay, good, good. Finding the difference between addresses, good. So let's do the following. I'm gonna take a copy of X0 and put it in X1. Then I'm gonna use X1 as both the pointer and the counter, you'll see. So here's the top of the loop. LDRB of X, sorry, uh, going into W2. Uh, and it's from X1, increment by one. Okay, compare branch not zero to one backwards. Now, already you can see this code is much higher performance. Let's say your string was a million characters long. You're really verbose. In this program, in this code, there are four instructions in the innermost loop. This main loop, there are four instructions. In this loop, there's two instructions. So this, this version is twice as fast. Okay, now well, let's finish. So to begin with, X1 and X0 were the same. So subtracting one from the other, you get zero. But then you advanced over one character. So subtracting, you get a difference of one. But we need to take into account the null terminator. So I'm going to subtract from x1, x1. I'm going to subtract one because I want to take advantage, uh, take into account the null terminator. And now I'll move to w0, uh, and this will work. W1, it won't matter. No, 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 what the heck am I doing? Okay, uh, so now I want to subtract the bigger number, which is in X1, uh, and uh, the smaller number from the bigger number. And now I'll put it in W0 from W1 and return. All right, now let me call this and see if it works. So instead of my STRLEN, let's call MS. All right, uh, oh, I did the same mistake as I did last time. Okay, 48. Forty-eight. compare and branch. 
not zero. So that should have been W2. And I, whoops, damn it. And I did a subtract, uh, put the results in X1. Okay. Okay. Now let's look at that code. And I'm, gonna, I'm about to uh, buttonhole people. All right, so Morgan, why do I have line, what is the purpose of line 49? I know what it does. It subtracts one from X1. What I wanna know is why. Okay, so you're taking advantage that of null pointer and you're making sure that, oh, you're, decre you're always gonna decrease X1 by one to, Okay, so everybody work it out. And, and Morgan, I want you to do this too, especially you, uh, because uh, this is your question. But everybody mentally try passing a string of a single letter. So let's say it's just the letter A. But we all know it's not just the letter A, it's the letter A and then a zero, a null. So take it from there. Okay, Morgan. Right, so I'm trying to, so you're comparing. Okay. So let's say we were using a null terminator. Okay. So on line 47, the first time through, Line 47 would put the letter A into W2 and then add one to X1. So line 48 finds that it's not zero because it's the letter A. So it goes back to line 47. Line 47 puts the null terminator into W2 and then adds one to X1. So our count, technically, without line 50, our count would be two for a string that was a single letter. So the null terminator is causing an increment on line 47. So to account for that, we have line 50, which takes one away. All right. So tell you what, let's uh, uh, stay where we are and uh, do a compile again, and let's practice a little uh, practice a little GDB. Okay. So GDB uh, of dot slash a dot out. Okay. And let's do a breakpoint at uh, main. And now I will just simply run the program with no command line arguments. Oh, that's not true. I'll, I'll, I want to run it once with just the letter A. So uh, let's see what happens. OK, so we're broken at main. Single step, single step, single step, single step, single step, single step. And I'm going to skip over this one. So that would be uh, N to skip over this call. And uh, I'll keep using N. So N, 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 N. So N says, don't, uh, it says skip over 
the next thing if it is a uh, function call. So don't step into it, step over it. Okay, so there's my first output. And now let's try uh, N again and again and again and again. And this time I want to step into MS. So that's the S. So notice I'm now in MS. And uh, what is the value of um, print in hexadecimal dollar uh, X zero? Okay. Let me see if I remember how to do this. Uh, muscle memory, examine memory, print it in hex at dollar x zero. Is that right? Uh, no, actually, I don't want it to print in x in hex either. So let's try that again. No, nope. uh, let's try that. You can use display. Okay, I can use display. So yeah, at D, least it works for me to display memory. X zero. All right. So, but I'm forgetting the syntax. That's what I'm forgetting. What is the I syntax? I think it is? thinks that no number is at address X zero. All right. Let me make sure I'm still where I think I am. So, uh, damn it. I think there's an X, but I don't remember the syntax. I'll get back to you on that. Or you could look it up on your own. All right, but where are we right now? Let's do a single step. Now, watch the letter A come into W2. So uh, print dollar W2. And that's the ASCII for A. And what is the value of W X zero, we saw that. And what is the value? Notice it's not in hexadecimal and dollar X one. Look at that, it's one more than X zero. So step, step. Now what's in W two, print dollar W two. There's my null terminator. You can send them upstairs. See this, tell your housemates. There you go. All right, so step. Oh, also, what is the value of X zero? Just to remind you, what is the value of X one? Look at that, it's two more. So step, right? And now it's one more. Now let's do the subtraction. What's in W1? The answer. And now I'll continue. Okay, so the program ran to completion. What's it mean by inferior one? Uh, it, the, uh, it means inferior, that means the first job launched by GDB. So the, my program was GDB's child. And for some reason they, they elected to call it the inferior. It's really kind of judgmental, isn't it? Okay. Good, well, that is what I wanted to do today. So let's stop that sharing. Let me ask you, what are the questions that you have? Okay. Most, most of the questions I had pertain to how I'm writing the single length list in C, which I'll probably ask you about later. Yeah. Now I do encourage you to write this program in a higher level language first. Now, if you want to use C++, well, sure, go ahead, but you're not allowed to use new and delete. That's not going to help you. You can, if you want, in C++, use malloc and free. So you might as well do it in C. Right? 
Now, the reason I'm suggesting you write it in a high-level language first is at this point, you're still getting accustomed to assembly language. Uh, and this is one of those, you know, malloc's, uh, you know, news and deletes and following pointers and dereferencing and stuff. So maybe you should uh, debug your algorithm in a higher level language rather than directly in assembly language. But after this project, it's reasonable to think that you might write the project in assembly language from scratch. You don't have to hand in the um, higher level language version. I say that in spec, right? What to hand in? Yeah, you just say hand in the assembly. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have to uh, hand in the, the C or C++. Okay, anybody have questions? Okay, the next, uh, uh, so seeing none, let's just get a preview of uh, what's next. And I'm gonna display the screen in a second. The next project is, now, so this one is actually fairly involved. So this is a harder, this is harder than P2. And that is to write a simplified version of tail. And what does tail do? If tail is like, is the opposite of, of head. So you have more or less, which will page through a file, head, in, in Linux will show you the first few lines. Tail will show you the last few lines. So you're writing a simplified version of tail in project three. Okay. And then uh, we get to do something fun for project four. Uh, we're gonna do some graphics. Okay. So Jordan, either you are <laughs> either you're running a filter to make your eyes look large or you're genuinely fearful. A little bit of both. Okay. So here in project four, I give you the code and I've already de-evolved it, deconstructed it. But this is the project where you have to figure out how to use floating point. So the purpose of project three continues your education about uh, malloc and free. And it uh, also, um, what, uh, I just lost my train of thought. So project three, continue using malloc and free. Uh, and also uh, you'll be uh, creating a circular buffer point of project four is to practice using um, an external library written in C, that's curses, and also to use floating point. So project five is likely to be a, uh, a really enhanced version of mem copy, or perhaps a different, I'm not sure I'm going to do that. Not going to. Not sure I'm going to do the mem copy. So if it's not mem copy, then it would be the neon instruction set, the vector instruction set. So what's no, Jordan? What's yes, Jordan? Everything. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, it's two o four. If no one has a question, come on. Nobody has a question. I have a question about like what I did wrong on the last assignment, but that's more of a me and you, not a whole class thing. Uh, well, why don't we? Well, we've got five minutes, right? So, All right. why don't we? Uh, why don't we look at your code with your permission, right? 
Now, yeah, did well, I give you some comments? Yeah. Sounds awesome, actually. I, I gave you some comments, right? Didn't I? Uh, not when I checked. Last I heard, you just gave me... That was what I was going to ask about, because what happened was it was like... Maybe I missed it, but it just said my score. It didn't say the grade I got. All right. Grade. Well, I, I think I gave you some comments. I gave a lot of people comments. Um, yeah, so you, you just gave me this... You, you explained how you split up the score, but you didn't say what I did wrong. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, oh, you're, you're first. You're always first. Yeah. Okay. Now, I can't. Uh, so. Uh, I believe you click the arrow to get to the other file. Uh, yeah, but what I want to okay, well, forget about it. I, I I did give you some comments, but let's take a look at no, that's the next person. Oh, screw it. You and me will do it together. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Okay, questions. I found I found the comments. I don't know what I did, but all of a sudden they appeared. So, okay, Amanda, you haven't said anything. You have a question. No questions. So you're ready to take the final? Absolutely not. OK. Is it because maybe you have a question? Um, no, I'm just generally confused about all of this. So I just need to practice more. Right. So what? Well, tell us, what is your plan to get unconfused? Do the projects and ask questions as they come up. OK, sounds reasonable. You might want to uh, uh, watch some of the help videos. By the way, let's take a look. Let's take a look at, uh, uh, this will take only a minute. Let's see what videos are now online. And uh, my videos, I'll sh And now playlists, and 3510. All right. Well, I can't see that. All right. So here is a 37 minute version of writing P1 from scratch. So you can watch this class's video. It'll be up later today, but it's uh, going to be 100 minutes. This version is. Uh, oh, and I didn't make this one public yet, so let me do that. Uh, yeah, I need to make this one public, public, public. All right, I don't want to hear myself. So how do I edit the video? Edit yeah. video, yeah. Yeah, edit the video and uh, Visibility on the right. it's now public and done and save. Thank you for that advice. Uh, let's go back to the ch channel content. And let's go to the playlists. This is such an awkward interface. OK. And let's move that to the top where the other helps are. OK, so there's quite a few help sessions. Uh, and if you are confused about P1, either watch today's video, which is going to be 100 minutes, or perhaps watch uh, the 37-minute uh, version. It's got the same content. There's some help on GDB online now. Uh, a demonstration of what registers get blasted and which ones you need to save. Okay. 
So if you are confused, watch the help videos. If what is confusing you is not answered by that, then reach out to me. And uh, uh, Cephas has my, uh, my blessing and thanks for acting as an informal tutor as well. Okay. All right, then. I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you. Good luck, human being. Have a good time. Um, I'll probably. Should I try and find some time with you today to talk about the thing I was asking, or? Uh, no, I prefer not to have meetings on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, especially Thursdays, because not only do I teach at this, you know, for for uh, six hundred minutes. Still recording. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so I prefer not to do meetings on Tuesdays and Thursdays, Thursdays especially because we also have the barbecue. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's like six hours also, or five, five Thank hours. you for moving the deadline of this project to Monday. Yes, I did move it. You're welcome. Okay. Bye-bye. Goodbye. See you Look later. Look forward to our meeting. Bye.